Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the 2023 Rocky Mountain Municipal Elections Candidates Forum, hosted by the NAACP. The NAACP mission is to achieve equity, political rights, and social inclusion by advancing policies and practices that expand human and civil rights, eliminate discrimination, and accelerate the well-being, education, and economic security of black people and all persons of color. Tonight, we take a moment to hear from our candidates, their vision and plans for progressing our city. This candidates forum is hosted by the Rocky Mount NAACP, and we welcome you this evening. Good evening again, and I am 
Sydney Meeks, Political Action Chair for the Rocky Mountain NAACP. The NAACP Candidates Forum follows the nonpartisan, unbiased, and impartial format following 501c3 guidelines. Cooper and I will be your moderators this evening. The forum is recorded and media correspondents may be present. Time limits for all comments will be strictly enforced. In fairness to all candidates, the audience, and the audience, excuse me, we ask that these limits will be respected. Each candidate will have one minute for, excuse me, that's there, two minutes for opening remarks to introduce themselves. Next, the moderators will ask pre-selected questions to both mayoral and council candidates. All questions prepared have been screened by the panel to ensure that they are applicable to all candidates, are not personal in nature, and are addressed to subjects relevant to this forum. Candidates, so that we can address as many questions as possible in the time available, each of you will have one minute to answer each question. If time permits, you will have two minutes for a closing statement. All candidates will have 30 seconds to respond to any targeted statements made by another candidate. After the rebuttal, there will not be any opportunity for a counter rebuttal. We will proceed to the next question. Moderators will indicate when you have 15 seconds remaining and when you are out of time. Voters, you will have an opportunity to engage with the candidates following the forum. We have passed out slips of paper for you to write your questions down. And after completing the pre-selected questions, we will randomly select a number of questions from the audience, if time permits. At this time, please silence your cell phones. There will not be an intermission during the forum. If you need to excuse yourself for any personal need, please do so at your own leisure, as quiet as possible. Voters are encouraged to remain respectful during the forum. Please refrain from outbursts and applause. Again, thank you for coming. At this time, we will proceed with the introduction of candidates. Remember, you have two minutes each. Candidates, we will go in order of mayor, ward one, ward five, and ward four, excuse me, and ward five for introduction. Um, so now introducing the mayoral candidate, Teresa Austin Stokes. It's kind of tight, so you kind of might just want to just speak in the mic. You can grab everyone. My name is Teresa Austin Stokes. I am a candidate for mayor for this election. Many of you may remember me as the voice that was heard on the RG radio station on the film in Soul 92 throughout the year. Some of you may remember me as a professional baker. I didn't realize how many lives are touched by having a business located on the Edgecombe County side of the city that serves the community just by baking delicious fresh baked goods. Some of you may know me as being um, a staff member at Edgecombe Community College, having the opportunity to see how our students were impacted but how uh, the lives were changed just by coming across their paths. I'm a wife, a mother, and a grandmother who truly has a heart for the city and its people. My advocacy for the city did not start over my, it didn't start during election time. I have always had a connection with this community by making sure that they were informed about various issues that we've had throughout our city. I ask that you realize that throughout the years, my heart has always been for the people. And tonight, it is no different than the years that I started in this community. Uh, I, other than that, I'm just happy to be here, and I will represent you with integrity and professionalism. Thank you. Next, we'll have mayoral candidate Bronson Williams. I said I'm Bronson Williams. Mayor candidate for the city of Rocky Mountain, many of which I ran for mayor in 2015 against David Combs and ran in 2019 against our current mayor, Sandy Robinson. During that time, I believe I've built relationships with people in this community in which you know 
You know me as a person who will stand up and fight loud and hard for issues concerning every citizen in our community. Whether you're young, you're old, you're black, you're white, it doesn't matter. Issues must be addressed, and I've been that person who can address those issues on the front line. I am a business owner. I own Promised Land Child Care Center, where we help children every single day. We help families every single day. We're going out and working hard to make ends meet. We want to be able to provide a service and provide that service consistently. WNCR Television. I was fortunate enough to buy that television station. One of the only folks in our, our uh, state that happens to be a minority that owns the television station. Was able to purchase that in 2018. I've always been a go-getter, always willing to talk to any and everybody, and always willing to bridge gaps. I hope that throughout my life and during my a short term, I'm 37 years old. But some, some people think I've been here 60 years because I've been so involved. But the reality is, I, I believe in this community, I love this community, and I want you to know that I appreciate and respect each and every person's views and opinions in our community. It's no one side or this side. I want to hear the whole story. Let's be fair, let's be honest, and let's be transparent in this city. And I love to death called Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. Thank you. Next, we will have the incumbent councilman, Andre Knight. Good evening, everyone. Andre Knight, uh, running for re-election for Ward 1. And I want to continue the momentum and the progress that we have had in the last 20 years. I'm running on the agenda, which I started out when I first ran in 2023. Diversity, inclusion, and equity. In the areas of employment, which are salaries and pay, uh, community participation, which all our neighborhoods, associations, and presidents, and citizens will have a seat at the table to, to voice their views. Also, equity when it comes to redevelopment in underserved communities. Uh, and also, affordable housing, which is one of our main uh, priority in this city. So I would hope that you would uh, find, uh, uh, I would hope that you would reelect me so we can continue this momentum that we have here in Rocky Mountain. We have a lot at stake here in Rocky Mountain. We have come from a long ways and we don't need to go backwards, we need to go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have um, city council candidate, Troy Davis. Good evening. My name is Troy Davis. I grew up in the network community. Um, our house on fire in Philadelphia is where I relocated from. My grandfather, Cold Sweat, Charles Davis, picked us up and moved us to Rocky Mountain in 1995, and I've been here ever since. Um, I grew up in network. I see where it, where it was when we first moved here. I see where it went um, over the years, and I would like to bring it back to where it used to be. Um, I'm a graduate of Winston-Salem State University. Uh, go Rams, <laughs> um, and uh, I graduated with an IT degree um, in 2013. I relocated back to Rocky Mountain to continue my journey of removing boards and windows. I've been very successful. Um, I'm an employer, I'm a developer, um, and I'm just a, a regular person. And I feel like um, the citizens should be able to approach you as a regular person, person as well. Um, some of the projects that I've tackled is um, the Davis Lofts on Main Street. Um, I have a restaurant called Main Street Gastro Club on, on Main Street. Um, Starlaway Apartments, um, as you all know, were boarded up. It was about 13 apartments that were occupied, living in below. I, I wouldn't even have <laughs> let, let an animal live in it, but uh, we brought them up and got them back um, to where they're above living standards. Um, I just believe in my community. I believe that I can represent this community well. Um, I believe that I can do some serious changes in this community. Um, and I would like to continue along my path of removing boards from windows with the help of um, the board of the and the rest of the city of Rocky Mountain. Thank you. We will now hear from the incumbent, Councilman T.J. Walker. Uh, 
Good evening, everybody. Thank you, first of all, to the Rocky Mountain Chapter of NAACP for hosting this forum. I'm T.J. Walker, born and raised in Rocky Mountain, 31 years old. I'm the grandson of Reverend Thomas L. Walker, the son of Reverend Timothy and Annette Walker. I'm married with three children, Ty Tyler and Tamia, my wife, and Brianna, who is now the head of South Side Academy. And I am the current city council member of Ward 4. Uh, that is who I am. Uh, I love people, I love serving people. Uh, and for everybody here that, that's running, uh, whoever wins, uh, whatever city it is, uh, just know that uh, serving city council is not always what it looks like from the outside. But uh, for whoever it is, uh, I wish you all the best of luck. Uh, thank you all for being here. To all of the people here, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here with you. And so good to see you. Thank you. Next, City Council candidate Everett Silver. I want to say good evening to everyone. I am Everett Silver, and I'm running for City Council Ward 4. And it's exciting because uh, there's so many challenges, as you've heard in the room. Uh, I've been here, I've uh, been in this community for over 30 years, some of which I went to school here, received my education here, moved back to D.C., came back. We're about to celebrate 20 years of ministry of the Dunamis Outreach Ministries. Our ministries have gone out, served this community, and seen the disparities. Uh, we've given out boxes of produce, foods. We've seen and talked with people right in the street. Being a parent, uh, understand some of the situations that the school system, uh, understand what our children may need. And so I want to continue as well the progress I believe our city has made. And I want to tell you this, many of you may know me and know my face to be familiar, but at the same time, you should be understanding that it will be easy to trust and the hope that you're looking for when we talk about uh, better homes, we talk about uh, better roads, we talk about better chances, chances of those that have been less fortunate and may have been uh, convicted felon, knowing that if they pay their restitution, serve their time, and they can get back out into the community. I think that is that's hope. And we want to provide different platforms, different services, and to make people aware of what's afforded to them. I've always said that I believe that it's how the information has been disseminated out to the community that I think we have a gap there. Uh, and sometimes when people that can uh, afford uh, to understand what can I do to serve my community, then I need that information, not what I've heard, but get correct information. And so how we disseminate that information to me is critical. And so with that being said, many people refer to me as a Renaissance guy because I'm just, I have a lot of gifts and skills, but most importantly, organizing and also okay, time. Keep, you know, uh, the opportunity to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from City Joshua Robinson, everyone. I am a father, uh, also a business owner, an educator, a uh, public school educator, proud uh, for seven years um, until this year when I found out that flipping burgers would pay me more than educating our students. And that's a whole other conversation in and of itself. So I came to Rocky Mountain with my family. Uh, we started in Elm City, born and raised, sick, raised in Elm City, eating pickle, eating hot dogs, and blows cheese biscuits. And now I'm in Rocky Mountain because what I want to do is make it so that my children that I see every day can grow up in a city that they're safe, that they love calling home, and that they can also grow up and want to give back. Because that's all I've done all my life. Give back, volunteer, and make sure that everywhere I step foot, it was better when I left. And I don't intend on leaving here to those people. Thank you. All right, excellent. Let's give a round of applause for our candidates. <laughs> We will begin with three general questions for the mayoral candidates. Remember, you have one minute to answer. What do you see as the primary, as, as the mayor's primary role, and what does the role of mayor entail? What do you see as the mayor's primary role, and what else does the role of mayor entail? Feel free. I feel that the mayor's role um, is to be as a, as a parent or someone who is a guardian. 
Therefore, the mayor's role is to protect and to advocate and push forward the agenda of the city for the best of all citizens. We would not treat our children any differently. And we know that as Rocky Mount, we are compiled of two counties. But both counties make up Rocky Mount. So as the primary rule of the mayor is to protect, nurture, and to guide the city in the direction that best serves the citizens, no matter what background they have, but to be a protector and also to make sure that the best efforts are put forward to make the city the best it can be. What do I see as a role and responsibility of the mayor? The mayor of our city is the greatest ambassador our city could possibly have. He is a brand, he is a face, or she, to be the face of our community. That's important. A, a mayor also should ensure that he or she has control of the business meeting in which they conduct each and every month. It's important that we understand that the mayor's role is not just in the council chambers, but in the communities in every area of our city, whether it is Candlewood, whether it is Hargrove Street, Cokey Road, Rose Street, you name it. Every street belongs to this city. There should be equity. So it's important that the mayor engage in conversation with all citizens, business owners, to continue to build the city like never before. What skills and experience do you have that you believe would be beneficial to you as a mayor? So one of the primary things on base communication, so I, uh, I forgot to mention this earlier, I graduated from East Carolina University in Greenville, North Carolina, where I majored in communication, media studies, the impact of what does media have on people. And so a mayor's real role is communicating with the people, letting them know what's going on in, in the community, being sure that we're able to understand what is going on, not just um, here, there, anywhere type situation, but have true information. So as you see me every day, those who may watch the television station, WNCR TV, and listen to me on WAJA 102.5, there where I give information every single day. That is a skill set that I have, a people's person as well. Engaging in those hard conversations, those are some skills that I bring to the table, and being a business owner. I started in business, I could say, uh, as a teenager, selling uh, snow cones, pickles, you name it, uh, out of my, my, my bedroom, so to speak. And so, that's time. Thank you. I too graduated from East Carolina University um, with a minor in broadcasting, but I have expanded more in that minor um, to use in this community. Being able to be on the same level, no matter where you are, uh, it's a gift to be able to connect with people. Being informed of the informed community is important. Throughout the years, my skills of just taking the opportunity to relate to people on a one-to-one -one or at a group level has been a positive um, force for this community because there were situations, a lot of situations, that if information was not put out or relayed to the community, they would not know, have known about different um, programs or the people that we have in this community who have made impact um, throughout the area. <coughs> One thing for sure, my relationship with this community has always been about the people and for the people. So I will continue to build those relationships as we move forward. As mayor, what would be your top three issues? Top three issues as mayor. You know, I see the mayor as a unifier of the council as well. We, we got to work together uh, from all seven wards. And so I want to be sure, just as the council did a few weeks ago at a retreat in Durham, uh, that they continue to build stronger relationships with each other. Because we cannot have a positive and growing city if we're disconnected at the council level where our legislative decisions are being made, where ordinances are being created. That is important. And so it's important that we have uh, that thought process of working throughout this, these issues holistically, that we look at them all the way around. So those are the key priorities 
uh, that I will have as the mayor, and being sure again uh, that we engage in meaningful conversations with everybody. Okay, could you please repeat the question just one more time, please? Yes, as mayor, what would be your top three issues? Top three issues, affordable housing. <coughs> um, in addition to affordable housing, uh, public safety, and economic development. There is no doubt about it that affordable housing is a huge issue, not just here locally, but across the country. When you meet people who are being forced out of their homes because we have developers coming into the area and raising up the rent, we should be concerned about where the people who have vested in this community should live. So affordable housing is top priority and should be put on the list as something that we push forward immediately. Not only that, economic development, uh, we cannot leave out the fact, but without economic development, we cannot move forward. Thinking about the development that's happening, there's no seconds. doubt about it that you see the development just occurring on one side. But our goal <coughs> is to make sure the development occurs throughout the city. Thank you. Now, at, at this time, we will have three questions for each of the city council candidates. Remember, you have one minute to answer. What skills and experiences do you have that you believe would be beneficial to you as a council member? Anyone can answer, but it's for all of you. So all of you. I think the skill uh, that's most important to me is being accessible to people, making sure that you're answering phone calls, uh, that you're not allowing people to feel as if they're forgotten. In this role as counseling, a lot of people really don't understand what we do, and so they look at us as being their leader. Uh, they look at us as being to do a lot of things that we really don't have the power to do or the capacity to do, but still being able to be accessible to people, being accessible for people, uh, means a lot for people to know that you're there for them. You at least answer their phone calls and show up to the door if you need to. I think one of the uh, critical things is that we have to understand my, I, I think organizing, which I'm great at organizing, getting people together, also serving community and giving them and knowing the heart of what needs to happen in your community, not just what you hear, being out there. And so a good organizing skill is what I'm best at. Also, uh, when you think in terms of, uh, I mentioned the disparities of this, this community, uh, being a person that uh, graduated from St. Augustus University with organizing management, uh, skills, you have to be able to connect with people. I'm out there every day, I'm talking to them, I'm uh, hearing their concerns. The pastor hears a lot of things, we counsel, we inspire. And so with doing those things, I think it's critical to be able to listen at what people are saying and then disseminate that information back to our community. The skills I, I will bring and currently uh, have on the city council is the knowledge of the history of Rocky Mountain. Uh, where we come from and where we are going. Uh, also, being able to work with stakeholders um, in, in our city, uh, knowing the disparities and what uh, areas we need to focus on, and to uh, be smart enough to know uh, when uh, a policy come up and it's uh, set up barriers for our people and, and certain uh, segment of people in our community. Uh, when policies or when uh, language is uh, presented to us, uh, when it discriminates against uh, a part of our city. 15 seconds. This has to be keen enough to know that and know how to navigate through that and then offer a solution that everyone will benefit in this city. Thank you. The experience I bring um, to the city to be on this council or on the council um, it is being able to work with people, um, educating and informing people. Um, there's a lot of people, when I go door knocking, that don't have a clue about some of the incentives that, that are available um, for the elderly community to get a new roof or to fix their plumbing. Um, but we gotta do a better job of that as a city, of, as a community as a whole. Um, educate our elderly folks on um, the availability of the incentives that's available to, to keep them in their existing homes. We talk about home affordability, but we can't even work together to work on issues to keep people in their current homes. So we have to figure out a way, um, a way to incentivize people to stay in their current homes, but also um, working with people and just educating people and 
uh, allowing people to voice their concerns without getting upset, taking your emotions out of it. That's it, thank you. Okay, before the council um, continues to answer, just a couple things. If you all could continue to silence your cell phones, um, just so that it doesn't disrupt media personnel that's in the room, and then candidates, um, I'm disrupting your answer when I say 15 seconds. So our timekeepers are in the back and they're holding up a sign for 15 seconds, so just be mindful of that. And make sure you're speaking in the mic. You can continue. Sorry. Uh, myself, with some skills and experience that I bring to the table, is uh, one, being able to connect and mobilize people. I took part in, um, in running four campaign elections in the town of Elm City and we had the highest voter turnout and we elected a new mayor and four city councils, all because I was boots on the ground, I connected with people, I didn't mind going and talking with people about why we needed a new council. It didn't matter who, who was there, how long they were there, it's about where they're doing now for our people. And I connected that point, and we got them out of the seats. Another thing that we did, that um, another skill or experience is that I'm a really good listener. I'm the youngest person ever in my family to get married before 24, and I'm probably still the youngest married person in my family because I'm a good listener. And I think my wife agrees with that. And lastly, I have integrity, and that's from my, my pastor. He just said, be a man of your word, don't make promises you can't keep, and I've done that. My top priority is one with the youth development. I think as a city, we have to find a way to implement uh, more funding for our youth, uh, to give them opportunities for their development, uh, whether that be uh, workforce development, i.e. like uh, community colleges or OIC. Uh, but we need to be able to do more of that. Further, some of our local nonprofits. Nonprofits are boots on the ground. They're the ones that are actually engaged with people on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, doing the real work. And then also um, economic development. We've got a budget of over almost 200 now and $60 million plus. And so trying to find ways where we can create a community um, that drives economic impact. And we have uh, ways to really increase our economic capacity in the city of Rocky Mount. Because when you have more money, uh, you're able to spend more money. Thank you. Well, let me say, uh, I think one of the things that I would really just start out supporting is uh, our housing bond. I would talk about the downtown investments, uh, public and private partnerships where we can work along with our investors, with local partners in town, with, with us, our banks, uh, just giving that information out where we can find it. I would also uh, talk to the city about creating uh, what looks good for young entrepreneurs to invest in them. Some of the uh, capital startup money, what will we do in those areas? Uh, again, what bothered me and I, when I'm out and about to see that uh, we went to a, a water park and they charging kids money, trying to figure out things that what we can do better to help our community. So those things are, are critical to me and so I wanna help and see uh, workers all across the board get fair pay as well as livelihood for all in both counties that we do serve. We need housing, housing, housing. We need affordable housing. And we're working on that with the housing fund. A hotel in downtown Rocky Mountain, right here on the east side where you're sitting, the center of it all, the redevelopment of our downtown. More minority <coughs> and women uh, having a chance to get more of the city contracts. Uh, up until this present time, it was 0.2% of minority and women that were benefiting from the city contract, which is millions and millions and millions of dollars. Now that had increased to a little bit over 
We need to increase that. We need to increase the wealth. We need to increase the, the racial wealth gap that is in this city. Uh, also, we need to make sure that uh, we continue to uh, in, uh, fund our police department so our community can be safer. Uh, looking at economic development, especially on the east side where uh, development has been uh, deterred and has been uh, redlined and have not uh, been invested. That's time. That's what we need to focus on. My focus. Uh, my focus, focus would be um, more geared towards our youth. Um, the Parks and Rec Department should close at 5 o'clock because that's when the kids are getting out of school. We need to give them something to do. We have one pool, we just spent $3 million renovating uh, that pool. Uh, we could have probably built three pools across our city with that $3 million. Um, we need more activities for our youth, um, some computer programming, um, some more pool activities, um, educate them um, to keep them out of trouble. Housing, obviously, affordable housing. I do not support a housing line, but affordable housing in our city is very key. Um, safety, public safety, and community and economic development. Um, and, and especially in Ward 1, um, Edgecombe County, um, we're tired of seeing chicken joints pop up. We don't want any more chicken joints, no more dollar stores. We want to see from the people I see, I talk to every day in World War One. We want uh, we want a drugstore. We want a Walgreens to come back. So I would be uh, more inclined to fly down or up wherever Walgreens corporate office is and work with that CEO to bring the Walgreens back to Rocky Mountain. Thanks. Uh, Mayor Hall, just wanted to echo uh, Councilman Knight about housing, but not just housing, but livable housing livable, affordable housing where people ain't just getting the money and investing it just so someone can get by. We want people to be able to enjoy their home, be safe in their home. And another priority that I feel like is gonna be important is also unity. Uh, one of my priorities is that I live in Ward 5 and I tell people all the time, I can leave my garage open all night. And I've done it several times after working on my food truck being so tired. But I wake up in the morning and everything is there. But guess what, that's not the case in every ward. So we need to do better with working with every ward, seeing how can we make our neighborhood just as safe as theirs. And it's gonna take us as councilmen working together to do that. On the vote, it's not a personal vote. Uh, but we talk about housing, and for me, I support a housing bond. We have a lot of housing stock already that exists in Rocky Mountain. I believe we enforce code on the housing we have and our delinquent in taxes that have weeds and grass assessments of tens and twenty thousand dollars. If we enforce our code, uh, if we move into a plan of a foreclosure plan to create affordable housing, we can redevelop the housing stock that we have. Thank you. Okay. Next question. Well, last question. How would you use your position to disrupt systemic racism and prevent attacks on black lives? Feel free to use any examples you have done previously. I think being elected, that's the first step you take with disrupting systematic racism. Um, the policy and the ordinance, uh, Councilman Knight said earlier, for instance, we have an ordinance now for speed cushions. Uh, if you are not a property owner, you're not currently uh, considered as an existing member of that community to sign off on the petition to have speed cushions. So that is one uh, ordinance that I've been working diligently on since 2019. And as a matter of fact, it was the first to implement speed cushions in Ward 4 on Recreation Drive. And I believe that's just one of the uh, particular examples of systematic racism that we've seen in the ordinance. Because not everybody's a homeowner. And not everyone's a homeowner on the street, but still doesn't have the right or the say so on the street that they live. To me, that is systematic racism uh, that is deeply rooted in racism and is something that we should continue to fight for. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. The question is, how would you use your position to disrupt systemic racism and prevent attacks on black lives? Feel free to use any examples that you've done in the past. Okay, so, you know, when everybody thinks about a developer, they think about somebody coming into their community, raising their rent, and kicking people out. Um, I purchased Starlingway apartments on Starlingway. Um, 59 units that were probably by far the worst uh, apartment units in the city of Rocky Mountain. Um, you know, I didn't, I, we have about 15 tenants. All 15 of those tenants are still at Starling Lake. They're not paying astronomical amounts of rent. Um, and so those are ways we work with developers to bring them to our community. 
all developers aren't bad developers. We need as many developers as we possibly can to get in the city and rebuild the city. But also um, to protect black lives, um, obviously we gotta look at the policies that's on the books. Those policies haven't been changed, altered since they were in existence. So we have a lot of Jim Crow laws on in our policies and procedures in the city of Rocky Mountain, even with a black majority council. Thanks. I think one of the main ways to disrupt systemic racism is to, one, have people in the seats that understand it, that experience it. My background in research, literally, that's why I can read you some of the books that we talk about, some of my sociology of racism, class sociology, even education. If you don't understand what it is, how can you truly address it? And another way to combat systemic racism is to get people out of seats that won't acknowledge it because it does not exist. And I think that it is not by chance that I am the only representative for Ward 5 City here today on the Edgecombe side. And this is where you still gonna see me at. Even though I live in Ward 5, I'm gonna be all over, but it's not by chance that the individual that represents one side is not here on today. You have to understand it to address it and not be afraid to step up to it. Let me say that I was one that was right in the direct. My wife was the first uh, uh, assistant city clerk um, and we experienced race, racial slurs, we experienced things within our own uh, or that, that department and you talking about we fought. I was one of the ones that helped before we had an all uh, African American council to where I, I went out and canvassed for uh, the Angela Bryans and G.K. Butterfield and Shelley Williams and go out and see things and fought for each other. But at the same time, guys, just because we look like us don't mean everybody supports us. What that means is that a lot of times we have gotten people off uh, by saying that they're for you and they're not made particularly be for you, but I know it firsthand. And so we gotta get out on the floor and, and walk in, in our boots and make people know what's going on. As I ran on the first time, unbossed and unbossed. I could come to the table boldly without compromising my integrity and refusing to take crumbs from the master's table and for our people to take the crumbs. Uh, we disrupt, when I say we, uh, Rocky Mountain had experienced that racism from 1867 to 2003 in employment, no diversity. We only had two black department heads. Now we have over seven or more with making six figures. The fire department never had an African-American chief, and we broke that barrier. The police department never had an African-American chief. We broke that barrier. In our housing, we are breaking the barrier because we did a study on the disparity of housing in our community. We broke that barrier. They said we could not build an event center, but it's right across the street. They said we couldn't have the housing, and it's right across the street. When they say no, we say yes. We're going to bust it up, and we're going to have prosperity, and inclusion That's for all of Rocky Mountain. And I do have a rebuttal. Okay. Um, you can take uh, your time now to rebuttal. Uh, rebuttal was someone said that the council had not done anything to change uh, uh, racism in this city. That's one thing that this council has been accused of, changing the system that was put in place with the Jim Crow. This, that was this council from 2003 into present, and we don't need to lose that momentum. We need to move forward, and we need to pay our sanitation workers. Thank you. All right, um, and this is, are all the candidates finished answering questions? Okay, thank you. Um, at this time, we're going to give you all a few minutes. We're ahead, ahead of schedule, um, which is good for an event like this. Um, we are going to take a few minutes for you to write down any questions that you may have um, that may be brewing that you would like to put on a piece of paper. And we'll have Misha collect the slips if you'll just send them down to your right. Send them to the right at the end of the row and we'll collect any questions you may have at this time. This is our halfway point. We are going to move into the questions. Um, for topics. 
So we only need to be at 650. We did get a little break. All right, now. Hey, 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 I know. All right, all right, all right. When you're done with your questions, just pass them down to the end of the room. Like church, like offering. To our live viewers, thank you for joining. We're going to be getting started in about five minutes. Um, feel free to take a break at home. If you're watching, go grab your snack or your drink. And sit back and relax. We'll be getting started in five minutes.
final call for questions.
not the way to attract developers and builders to our community, but also, um, like Raleigh, we can put alignments in place, or New York City for that matter. Um, we can require 10% of all housing that's built to be affordable. Um, but also, if, you're, if you want to avoid that, then you can put some money in a pot so that the city can give that to another developer to continue to build that affordable housing. Um, the city of Raleigh is, is doing something like that. I think they have over probably like $10 million in that pot. Um, that's, that's an initiative that we can take um, by um, putting that money in the pot, also acquiring those percentages um, for affordable housing <coughs> to developers and improving our community process. Again, uh, we need a housing bond. Uh, Rocky Mountain is entitled in the city, and the money that we get from HUD would not even touch um, the amount of houses that we need to redevelop or need to build. Uh, we need a housing fund. Also, uh, to redevelop, we want to redevelop our uh, homes in our community and build new homes. Uh, also, community wealth building. Uh, I'm hoping that this year we can look at a comprehensive housing plan. Right now, we have housing incentives up to 15000 but it is not enough. So when our staff go out and, and, and do the inventory and inspection in those homes, the need is so great. If you get a roof, if you have your plumbing in the shop, and your, your electro may be antiquated. So we need more than $15,000 to need housing incentives. And it's a strong wind on this council that's trying to stop these incentive grants because they're looking at as being hooked up or trying to get your friends' homes um, remodeled. But that is not the case. We recognize the housing need that's time. that needs to be replaced. I want to talk about affordable housing as well. Uh, I am on the uh, redevelopment commission, so we just had a, a meeting today dealing with affordable housing and trying to do something in, in Bill Street. But even before affordable housing, we really need to deal with uh, money in folks' pockets. How do we recruit better jobs? That, that affordability is so subjective. At the end of the day, what is affordability, right? Because affordability to one person is going to be one thing, affordability to another is going to be another. And so we must really have a defined plan as to where we want to go. And we must also uh, look at how we can bridge those gaps that's, that's really dealing with income and folks' pockets. And Bronson, I'm glad you mentioned talked about you know affordability is different from different families, different perspectives. But another thing that is also important is educating people on the process as well, how to fill out this application, how to get access to it. And guess what? Buying a house is more than just getting a little down payment assistance. It's also going to be how's your credit? What's going on? Do you need credit counseling? We need to have some type of committee that can walk alongside of these people as they are trying to get into these homes. And I think that's a great start. Excellent. Do you support the creation of an affordable housing bond? If so, how should the funding be spent? If not, why not? I support the affordable housing bond. I believe the, sp the spending is proof is in the pudding. We have 14 targeted low income communities, and that's the primary way that funding should go. Um, but on top of the housing bond, uh, because that takes time, um, the most quickest and one of the most sustainable ways we can see redevelopment for affordable housing is foreclosing on homes in the city, owning the home as a city, placing parameters around how the developer can develop that home to make it affordable, and we'll see quicker turnaround in our affordable housing if we want to see affordable housing now. Thank you. Certainly, uh, certainly I would support a housing bond uh, as the next mayor, but one thing I think that we must do before, as we move to a housing bond is we must have a distinctive plan as to what we want to see with that. Because going out and asking you that, hey, we want to raise $10 million, $20 million, $30 million, or $40 million, there must be a, a concrete plan. So what do we want to see? How do we want to utilize this money? Because you got to go to the LGC to get approval uh, for these things. So we need that, and we need community involvement as well. So it's not just seven elected officials who come to, up with an idea, but it's community engagement as to what they want to see. Because after all, it's going to be you as a taxpayer that puts that bill at the end of the day. Well, I, I'll add this is that since the city council uh, sets policy for our city, I just want to make sure that it's being fair in the process. Um, how many people know when the times are to 
some people can afford to put money in their homes and then turn around and the city will give them probably half of that back. There's another part of it where they will give you up to $15,000 to uh, renovate your house, knowing that even if it may not cost 15000 if it only costs seven, you don't get the rest of the eight. So I think, again, disseminating information, how we can dispel those things, we've got to be informed about really what we're getting. All right, if there are no other responses. I have one. Um, yes, I support the housing fund. And we do have a group uh, with Sue Perry Cole, uh, the community academy that comes to the council um, just about every council meeting, uh, laying out the priorities for a housing fund and, and, and affordable housing. So we are, uh, we do have groups that are being, that are educating our citizens. Also, uh, we have done a stu study on the 14 underserved communities. So we know we need it, and we know that That's time. Uh, what we, how are we going to do it? Yes, how are we going to do it? So, you know, I spoke and I said that I did not support housing bond. Um, obviously, um, I don't support the additional debt. I don't think the city can incur uh, more debt. Um, you know, looking at my grandma in the back of the room, uh, in the wintertime, her life bill is $900 in a three-bedroom, two-bathroom house. The metal bill. That's absurd. I think we need to look at ways that we can lower our debt, lower our utility bills, and focus on the real issues in our city, um, lowering um, the death rate of, of amongst our teams. Um, I think we need to figure out a way to get these teams off the streets put them into community yes, action programs. Thanks. Do you see any barriers in zoning that you would like to address? I believe that there are some zoning barriers that we have simply because they're just outdated. And there are um, times of changing different methods and methodologies of how we can change our zone. And so I believe our staff, uh, we need to do a better job to make sure our staff are attending these trainings and staying updated on some of the updates of zone. But there are many barriers that we need to address. Uh, I, I agree with Councilman Walker there, uh, that for years I've been advocating for an update of our comprehensive plan, our land use plan. I was delighted that this council has taken the time to do that this year. Uh, under the direction of the, the new city manager to really update our land use plan because that's important. You know, month after month, we're seeing people uh, coming to the city council wanting some rezoning issues that really uh, may or may not fit. Uh, but sometimes, as a council willingness to see the, the community grow, uh, we'll change those, those zoning things. But but certainly, we do need to update that plan. Uh, and I think that's that's coming. Uh, so those issues and barriers hopefully would be eradicated. I think that's what I was just going to. Right up here, I almost dropped the mic when you did it. Somebody said that. But um, also just enforcement, right? We, we got to enforce it. We got to stay behind things. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. All right. If no other mentioned, uh, you know, the systematic racism that exists for years in our um, planning and zoning, uh, and it, it has changed a lot um, the last um, couple of years. Uh, when you have uh, zoning and planning, when you steer development in certain areas and, and detour it from other parts of your city. Also, when it comes to certain people who get a bill from this, you set up barriers and hoops for them to jump through what all of them makes it, makes it impossible for them to even get the project done. And before they get the project done, they spend tons of money and then they just get discouraged and give up. And so I say that's hindering development when it comes to certain people in certain locations in the city. And one, one last thing. Many of us that's probably in this room, how many of us have driven down Atlantic Avenue and seen that house started renovations and didn't stop? I mean, it just stopped for years. Somebody didn't get there. Somebody didn't, didn't help. The information wasn't but it bothered me. I drive down Atlantic and I said, man, that's gonna be a nice house. And the weather beat it up again because somebody else. That's time. 
Absolutely, it's on the issues. Um, I think we need to, to create policies. Um, as, a, as, a, as a person seeking counsel, um, my job would be to create policies um, that will benefit everyone. Um, but there are truly some issues here. Um, the commercial code states that it's up to the local jurisdiction to make those rules, and currently, um, those rules are whenever that inspector wakes up tomorrow, he can change his mind, and the next day he can change his mind again. Um, so I think that it's up to the council to create policies and procedures to make that that process go a little bit smoother. What's more important for our city right now? Building new homes and commercial space or rehabbing, expanding, or better utilizing our existing homes and storefront? Um, I think that's a both and um, uh, thing. I think we need to do both. We need to re uh, re renovate both our existing stock, but also add to that stock. We have a lot of vacant lots. If you just go to the Holly Street community, there's a lot of vacant lots, probably over 50 to 100 vacant lots. If you go to the Meadowbrook community, there's about 10 or 15 vacant lots. If you go to Grant Street, Clark Street, I mean, we've torn down house after house after house with nobody rebuilding. So I think that uh, renovating and building both will drive out of the city further faster. Um, I think that we um, should do both, considering the fact that we have structures that are available. And if they are rehabable, then we should take put forth the effort to rehab those homes. Um, not only that, but in the process of rehabbing, uh, make sure that the safety issues have been covered, uh, make sure there are mold issues, um, asbestos and so forth. But in addition to rehabbing uh, the homes that we already have available in our city, we also need to have new development as well. I think also too, I just wanna add that and if we walk people through some of the processes that need to take place, what it takes. I've, I've talked to people in the community and some people have left their homes because they didn't get what they thought it was um, worth. So again, walking people along, uh, taking their hand through that process, I think would help as well. The question for both and I think we need to all, uh, preserve some of our historic our homes and our commercial building along with new development and blend and have a blended model. And I think that's perfect for our city. I've seen it all across the country and we'll work together as well. I agree with the masses. They're both of equal importance. Uh, one thing again that I will continue to harp on is enforcing code. There are just some stores on the commercial side out there within Ward 4 and all across the city, uh, Wards 1, 2, 3, and 4, uh, that we just shouldn't allow them to sit around and look the way they look. But because we don't enforce code, uh, these stores will continue to sit there. They'll continue to sit there as commercial. Our stores continue to make money, take our money, but yet uh, they're able to sit in our neighborhoods and look the way they look because we won't enforce code. And so uh, one of my main objectives, uh, uh, preferably and, and God's will, uh, we elected is to continue to push for code enforcement. For the final question in the affordable housing topic, how will you use the full range of your municipality's tools and resources to increase access to affordable housing and eliminate homelessness? Again, from an ordinance standpoint, from a council standpoint, in that capacity, continue to push for uh, housing bonds affordable housing grants, uh, affordable housing incentives that we can push for in our city uh, that I've done over the last four years. But then also really being engaged in your community uh, to figure out you know, what those needs are and what do they look like and where people are. Because a lot of times we try to fix solutions without even asking the questions. And we're solving something that we feel is an issue, but to our constituents, uh, it's not even an issue to them. So I believe it starts with people first, figuring out what it is they want and then figuring out from our, um, as from our desk, how do we implement what it is that people want. Thank you. Also, I uh, respond to that question. Uh, use the resources of the city. There's a thing that says that if you give a man a fish, you eat for a day, but if you teach the fish, you eat for a lifetime. 
you really have to connect affordable housing also to education. How do we use our city resources to really empower our local schools, to, to really change the mindset of our children uh, that are growing up in our community? That's gonna change the mindset of adults who may be going to our community colleges and accept to change the mindsets about uh, money management and financial literacy. These things are important. There's a disconnect in our community uh, when it comes to the city's responsibility and partnership with our education systems. And so I think that if we're not holistically looking at things, when we're dealing with affordable housing, we're gonna find ourselves back in the same situation again. I think to add, the key word you said, Russell, that I like is partnership. Um, Definitely partnering with some community organizations, churches, or what have you that's doing the work, especially when we look at our homeless population. Uh, my building that was downtown Rocky Mountain, Jamaica on Douglas, I had cameras. I would literally, at all times of the night, get ring alerts, and I would see um, some of our homeless community just walking around. And it was many nights after I would close the food truck, you know, they'll come up and say, hey man, can I get something to eat? You know, I slide them a burger, I slide them a fry, you know what I'm saying? Whatever I had. But one thing that truly stood, stood out to me is that it was the same people all the time. And I learned their names. I learned where some of them went to for tonight. I said, where are you going? But we really have to get a task force that's gonna truly deal with our homeless uh, need and make sure that they're taken care of as well because they are residents as well. Thank I think these uh, gentlemen spoke very, very well when it comes to dealing with the homelessness. Um, put that task force together to get out on the streets and figure out where they are. Um, living, I, you know, I lived in the city of Atlanta for a year uh, at the college, and they, they literally have someone out, basically going around, meeting them where they are, feeding them, making sure they fed, clothes, medicine, all that good stuff. And I think we need to focus on that as well. Um, I own business on Main Street as well. I, you know, one night. Um, we left uh, to shut the restaurant down, and a lady was sleeping in her wheelchair along the side of the road. So, I mean, those things break my heart, and I think that we need to focus on a way to, to get them unhomeless, um, but also, um, and we, we can do that by what Mr. Uh, T.A. Walker said, by enforcing COVID, re revitalizing some of these houses that we have left in. We have thousands of homes that sit around our city that are unoccupied, so we need to focus on that. using um, city resources means creating policy that we can get the job done. Uh, again, looking at a comprehensive housing grant funding uh, that's over $15,000, continue our housing incentive grants, our council initiative, which basically focus on uh, housing and redevelopment, uh, looking at partnering, continue to partner with the housing authority. Uh, they have large money, amount of money that comes from the federal government. Uh, for Section 8 and move those from renters to home ownership. Uh, another thing that we can continue to partner with nonprofit organizations such as OIC and others uh, by uh, having classes to teach people uh, how to do construction trade and how to repair their homes, going through an academy uh, to learn how to fix things in your home and how to get it energy efficient. I think we need to continue though, but we cannot do it if we don't set the policy. We cannot do it if we have people on the council that fight against the policies that we are that, that, that we are making for people to be able to be successful in home ownership and redeveloping their home. No, no one has uh, even mentioned dealing with some of these slumlords of quality of life around our city. Some of these slumlords, you, 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 talk, you talk, TJ, about enforcing enforce some of that on some of these slumlords. That we think about quality of life, some of the living conditions in our city is ridiculous. And, and it upsets me, concerns me. And yes, I am for the, uh, the housing bond, but at the same time, how do we deal with these issues? We gotta look at them. Just a little rebuttal. Um, when we talk about Policies, um, you, just, you know, we can go around and build all the affordable housing complexes we want, but that's not going to guarantee a house or a home for a convicted felon or for somebody else that's a, uh, a misdemeanor offense, you know, holding. So it takes private developers to come in to be able to work and meet our people where they are. And I'm one of those people. I am a developer that has worked with convicted felons, work with people that have criminal backgrounds, and all that good stuff. 
Retail we want to have downtown. What type of lawyers can we uh, have downtown to make it the uh, relocation of a judicial center? So just throwing money at something ain't gonna fix it. You got to have a plan, work that plan, and make it real. Yes. First of all, the fact that um, there were plans to develop downtown and to take a courthouse and try to develop a courthouse over affordable housing. Is that the real plan that we want to have for our city? Councilman Walker? Yeah. Well, I don't think the courthouse is in the plans for downtown development, but I think one thing that we need to do is empower our downtown development coordinator, Ms. Tanika Bryant, uh, who's recently been hired, empower her to be able to connect with developers that have a mindset uh, to be able to create equitable investment in our downtown. Uh, we talk a lot about putting money in the city, uh, I know it's just not me, but I've been sitting here tonight and we're talking about putting a lot of city money in a lot of different places. And we don't have that type of money uh, in the city. I'm all for putting money in places where we think. Councilman Walker? I'm sorry, one second. Councilman Walker, you want to speak? I will say that uh, I heard TJ mention about the Judiciary Center discussion, but you can't, TJ, keep opposing things that have moved us forward either. You can't keep meeting with different general assemblies outside of who we really are. You gotta know the truth. The truth is, we just have to work together. You can't keep opposing one another and the success that the city council Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Uh, Pastor Sullivan. Uh, very quickly, 30 seconds. But uh, you said that I can't beat the General Assembly that makes decisions about us, but then you said we got to work together. And so I'm unclear how can we work together if we don't want to beat with our assembly that creates a legislator from the state to pass down to our city. But again, thank you for coming. No, I cannot count it. Okay, yes, I ain't a rebuttal now. As someone that actually had it, I have a business just like many of us. We, we, we're downtown, you know, we saw we were the boots on the ground, and 
Um, I had a spot called the Mecca. It was quote unquote, I love the shirt, community driven. But one of the things that really irked me about the, the Mecca in our store was that on the weekends, we use my food truck to supplement income for our building to pay the rent so that our vendors don't pay anything to sell nothing in our store. But guess what? Food trucks make most of their money on the weekends. On Saturdays, my truck had nowhere for anyone to park. Guess why? Because of our Rocky Mount event center. And enforcement, as TJ talked about, it's a two hour lot across from me, but people would park there all day at the event center. So when we look at our downtown, a plan is important, but enforcement of that plan is going to be even better. Of course, I believe in downtown. My business is located, I have two businesses located on Main Street. Uh, one, the Davis Property Group, and one, uh, Main Street Gas Group. Um, you know, people talk about the amount of money that I've gotten, I've gotten from the city of Rocky Mountain, but don't talk about the amount of money that I put into the city out of my own pockets. Um, where was the city when I invested in a burnt up house on Beverly Road? The whole roof was burnt off, and I spent over $40,000 as a sophomore in college at Winston State University. So let's not talk about the amount of money that I've gotten from the city. But we, what we're going to talk about is the percentages of affordable housing that are in every single one of my projects that the city basically paid for. They paid to keep people in place in the homes that they currently live. And that's where we are today. Um, I want to answer the question, then I have a rebuttal. So I guess I can rebuttal that. Uh, again, we invested. And uh, this young man, uh, he saw the talent, and we would do it again if the talent comes to us, and the city has the money to do it. Uh, the first home we got was through the city, we almost given to you through Peter Barney, you and Conrad Williams, and that was the plan that he was trying to do to take our housing stock and give it to talented people that can take the property from the city and redevelop it and reuse it and get people back into the home. So I will talk about what the city has done. Talk about what, how you appreciate what the city has done to help you and others. Now, our downtown development. A lot of times we talk about don't have a plan, don't have a plan. We got a plan. But every time we put a plan out, I see some of the assassins in this room right now. <laughs> Sometimes you let people know too much of what you're doing. That's what you've been doing. So they can sabotage your plan. <laughs> we got a plan. We really got to get some. We got a hotel and a railroad. We got a parking that we bought it and they went to the General Assembly and, and passed laws so that the black man couldn't build the damn old parking lot. We got a plan. We got a plan. And what's the plan? One second, one second, I'm sorry. Just because I want to give the audience time to compose ourselves a little bit. We got a little loud, and one of my rules was no outbursts and applause. Okay, thank you. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Thompson. Thank you. Uh, we have, as a community, been operating in motion for far too long. There is some real issues that people are facing in our community. And we don't need no show. We need some work, we need some results, and we need some action. Uh, now, to think that we are uh, running for public office and think that people should not know what your plan is, that is insane to me. We run and ask the public for their votes. We, should, we must be transparent enough to let them know what we plan to do with their dollars, their money, and their community. Okay, did you answer the question? Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, Mr. Robinson. This is about those assassins. I'm trying to get one of those assassins out of War 5. Are you countering, Mr. Davis? You can't counter. His, his question, his answer to the question. He had 
his rebuttal first, thank you. Okay, go ahead. So, um, for, uh, for the facts, my first house was not brought through the city. My second house wasn't brought through the city. My third house wasn't brought through the city. The list goes on and on and on. The first house I got from the city was on Clark Street. And um, that wasn't because of city council's policy. That was because of one of our assistant city manager's policy, which should have been adopted by the city council, but they didn't think it was a great policy. Um, but furthermore, um, I was stuck to strict, strict procedures on how that house had to be remodeled. We had to have vinyl siding, we had to have windows, doors, and all, et cetera, to make it livable. Time. Okay, next question. Rocky Mount has created per capita more black businesses than anyone in the state next to Charlotte. If downtown is a place where black entrepreneurs grow, what policies we can implement that promote black entrepreneurship downtown? I think that um, some of the policies I would like to see in place is a lending pool. I think we need to come up with a pool of money that we can lend business owners or building owners downtown to make them successful. Um, but, but we can't just like Mr. Walker just said, we can't just give away money. So that is a lending pool. We're gonna lend it just like a bank, and we're gonna look at the cost of progress of, of that business. I think that's a way to be um, truly transparent and allow the citizens of Rocky Mountain to see their, their money at work. One policy I would like to see is a revolving loan uh, program for our downtown businesses. That would allow our downtown businesses to work together to allow the funding that we do have, not only to just be something from the city, we can incentivize it, we can get it started, we can be the seed funded, but then allow the businesses to be able to have that money revolving between all businesses so that they can work together and so they can grow together for other businesses to create opportunities as well. Yeah, I had said earlier that I think if you had a startup uh, capital uh, for them also involve some of the uh, City, uh, some of the contractors make it uh, accessible to everyone. So I think those things will happen with our downtown as well as um, uh, look at um, some of the money that you're saying we don't have a whole lot. I know there's something that we have there, what is it? You do your the front part or two. There, there are money there that we have to look at and make it up. I think great policy to have could also be having like a black business mentoring program. A lot of people when they start their small businesses or whatever, like literally they're just jumping into it, you know, with hopes and prayers and hoping that it works. And a lot of times we don't have it. I'm speaking for myself. Sometimes I, I didn't make the best decision on my investment, where do I go to how do I do a business credit. So I think having some type of mentors in these fields to help these small businesses so they don't have to worry about closing in a year or, or a month or what have you. We want to set them up for success as well as what these other gentlemen mentioned. You talked about uh, African Americans of black ownership and business, which is, is a struggle. It's already a struggle going into the business. So we can have an entrepreneur roundtable discussion. Also, come up with strategies and recruitment for other uh, businesses to come, uh, for what we already have downtown loan pool. Also, um, when I was, not when, but uh, a few years ago, uh, a group came to the city council um, after the Black Lives Movement, and we was talking about uh, a black business district. And uh, our community pretty much um, tried to throw it up out of the water. You know, why you want a black business district? I said, why you want a Chinatown? Why you want a little Italy? Why you want a Mexico City? You know, why you want a, uh, so when you can't frown on that when you said when you talk about black business uh, because they are important just as well as any other business and I think Rocky Mount uh, with the council have put policies in place Time. to help those small businesses to succeed. I would, I would like to see during the pandemic we had a Minority uh, funding of it, uh, available for uh, women entrepreneurs as well. Okay, next question. 
Do you support the entertainment complex with the casino proposed in Nash County? And how do you see that helping or handicapping inner city community development in Rocky Mountain? I guess I do support the uh, entertainment casino. Um, on top of that entertainment casino, we're talking somewhere up with $100 million of um, revenue that the uh, controlling municipality, which would be the city of Rocky Mountain has at their uh, exposure. And so when we talk about all the needs we have, uh, we could use $100 million of extra money per year. I'm not talking about $100 million uh, one time, I'm talking about $100 million a year that we could be able to benefit from as a city to address all the needs that you're in. So again, yes, I do support it. And as we look at our school system, I know we're not in the school system as a city, as a municipality, but some of that funding can even be used to address some of the needs that we're gonna see on Edgecombe County side with our Edgecombe County schools and Mr. Merchant. They're going to be funded, and we can't just rely on the state to do it. Uh, the local city and this is going to have to be involved. So, yes, we need it. Thank you. I cannot support anything that we don't know the full detail of the plans about. So, when it comes down to this whole casino or entertainment district, I have yet to see anything that is literally concrete. And even if we could use the money for both sides of the tracks, is that going to happen? Is that going to be in writing? Is that going to be something that really we can put into um, the Edgecombe side as well? Because I'll be honest with you, if I was right next door to where this proposed development would be, and the only businesses that truly could benefit directly are those businesses on that side. So if it's gonna come, then we have to see more, we have to get more input, and it's gotta be equitable. I'm kind of like Josh, I don't even know where the, um, if all the monies that, that may, uh, the city within itself would benefit. And then I was at the meeting and one of the developers uh, or the owners of the property said he was never told the casino was coming. He thought it would be some strip mall. He thought uh, it was some mixed uh, uh, sporting. Uh, so there are a lot of pros and cons, but if I thought about it, it brings 2,500 jobs to the city. Um, that's going to help um, someone uh, uh, have a better opportunity to work. I do know they, they will probably hire people that may have uh, uh, a record of my understanding. I just don't know enough about it. I would love to know. I think there are going to be more meetings about it, and I would love to be a part of that. And uh, they did have some information that we're going to look at it, so I would like to look at it and see the pros and cons. of a water park. 
uh, in our community or additional retail shopping opportunities as well. A $500 million investment in our community is, is, is something to really think about. To really think about how will it transform our community. Sure, do we have to also deal with some of those offset things that, that may occur? We do. We got Again, it goes back to my keyword, planning and being prepared. That's important. Uh, again, I'll talk about SWOT analysis. We've got to be sure we look at our, our strengths, our weaknesses, our opportunities, and our threats. But, but we can make uh, things work as we in this community are going to have to make this uh, merge of our school system work. Um, I would like to have additional information uh, about the casino, but what comes to mind is when the North Carolina Education Lottery was introduced, um, the word education was the word, but it put much funding when it first came on the scene. The trigger word was education. So a lot of people supported the lottery, thinking that, wow, our schools, our teachers, and so forth, all the money that's going to be funneled to help education. But as you can tell, even though the lottery is pouring some money into the educational system, the fact that the initial purpose was for education, you have to look at how much money is going towards education. Um, need more information on the casino, but also concerned that if the casino is um, passed, that the communities will get their fair share. Okay, next question. Do you support a pedestrian bridge downtown? If so, how would you help bring it to life? Um, I definitely would support a pedestrian bridge, but that question is kind of, I need to know what happened to the funding that Congressman G.K. Butterfield allocated for the pedestrian bridge because if the funding was allocated to have the pedestrian bridge, uh, what additional funding would we have to uh, add to it? As uh, someone is right here on East Thomas Street, right at the railroad track, I saw many vehicles parked behind my vehicle for many days for sometimes minutes long minutes, five minutes, waiting to go across the track. And don't let it be a Saturday when the event center is booming and they're still waiting because people aren't local. So they're like, oh, what do I do? See, we local, so we know what to do. We're going to turn that right, we're going to go there, and we're going to turn that left illegally, and we're going to go. But people that ain't from here, they are not going to get it. They're going to wait, and y'all going to be sitting behind them mad. So the thing that I think, I think it'll be a great addition. I mean, wherever they put it, I heard about it as well, and I was I was pleased with it. But you know, we, I'm still unclear about when is it going to happen and how it's going to happen. Yeah, I too support a pedestrian bridge. People are walking down our community, and oftentimes are stopped by uh, the train track. But as we are planning uh, that pedestrian bridge, we need to be sure uh, that that bridge is also handicap accessible, uh, because we also have a number of people who are uh, using event center uh, that may need uh, elevator lift as they go from uh, one side of the county to another. But the idea of having another connecting symbol in our community that will uh, bridge both Edge Cumber and Nash to really continue that thought process of uniting one Rocky Mountain I think is important. Okay, next question. Um, I would say funded, funded. Um, the city council would have to match that we get the money if we get the event center to, to, to match it, to, to build it. And so I, I don't, I, I support a pedestrian bridge, but also support of that uh, uh, overpass bridge. Yes. Uh, because when you park on one side and the car on that side, you still, you know, it, 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 it just the traffic count, I mean, the traffic pattern is just it's not good when you have those trains. And we have asked that we have the whole with CSX about that. But I do support the pedestrian bridge and the council should find a way to match that so we can build it as soon as possible. And that's one of our plans. Absolutely. I, I support the uh, pedestrian bridge on the whole market. I thought it was a great idea. Um, and I still think it's a great idea. I think the city council should find a way to build it. Build it fast and let's get it done. 
I'm just going to say I do support it because we need we need some other outlets. All right, we can all take a breather. We're moving on to the next section. We're getting there. This topic is quality of life. We'll ask three questions in this section, and we have another section with two questions. So, checking on towards the end. How do you feel about transportation options currently available in our city? Can all of our residents affordably get to where they need to go? If not, what will you do to improve transportation in our city? I think one thing we can do again, uh, we can do a uh, city budget for our city uh, bus system. But then also some of our city vouchers that we have for buses, I'm still hearing that even some of those aren't affordable for some people. And so affordability can be subjective to we need to really figure out what is the affordability uh, market for our city and then create uh, funding and funding paths through grants through the state, the DOT, uh, or federal grants through our congressional caucus to figure out how they can help us um, fund to help aid in transportation. And I also believe we have a study for uh, Uber system that uh, Wilson is utilizing, but uh, again, that's a long, long plan. There's no doubt about it. We have a population that depends on um, public transportation. Uh, what we could do is assess, have a, a recent assessment to see if their needs are being met. Um, simply because uh, I have talked to some residents who stress the need to maybe have additional hours um, added. But keep in mind, we still want to continue to have our um, city sponsored transportation and maybe add as an option, share riding, but do not get rid of the um, city sponsored um, transportation. But I would suggest assessing, um, have an assessment with those who take the uh, transportation, public transportation, and see if their needs are being met. Yeah, I think it is an issue that we have to look at transportation. I, I was just, um, I was eating lunch today and uh, limousine service uh, told me that he was transporting people because we don't have uh, additional transportation, whether we help some of the elderly, whether we help people get to appointments, and so we have to look at this transportation issue. I've always been concerned about not having anything leave at Rocky Mountain going to, Rook, to Raleigh. I, when I remember when I went to school there, there was no, there's nothing that we have in place to get us from here to there. So we have to look at it. So, um, public transportation piece, um, TJ Walker said it the best. Um, the Wilson system, I think the city of Rocky Mountain is studying it, but I've seen it in action. Um, I own 30 apartments in downtown Wilson as well. And looking at those vans pulling up, picking up lower income folks and transporting them to work or to get some groceries or to the mall or wherever, um, I think that's very beneficial. They have an app, they literally log into that app, request a ride. I think it literally is like a dollar when they request a ride. Um, the transportation mode pulls up, takes them to where they need to go, drops them off. I think it's great. I think we can get into it. Um, actually, um, you know, we have a transportation advisory committee. Uh, that some of our council members sit on that. That brings those uh, uh, plans or ideas back to the council uh, to keep us abreast. Also, that, that model that Wilson did actually came to Rocky Mountain first uh, through, through the Blackwell, but it was derailed uh, somewhere on the fifth floor. <laughs> so we're trying to get that back on track. Uh, also, we have uh, invested in bus shelters uh, for our elderly so they won't be standing in the interim as well to make sure that we have after hours uh, and affordability. Uh, we have vouchers for those who uh, cannot afford so that they can get to uh, their appointments, doctor's appointments, or run errands or whatever they need to do. So I'm in favor of continuing to improve the quality of life uh, with our transportation system because it's very important. Yeah, I will also want to talk about the on-demand transportation system, again, similar to what when we look at our uh, traditional transportation system and some of the destinations that they may be going to, are the consumers or residents in Rocky Mountain going to those places? And so when you have that point-to-point -point on demand service, you're actually increasing and enhancing the quality of life for our residents. So I think it is important that we really 
uh, I guess not derail those type of opportunities in the future. Uh, but we see a model right down the road, 15 miles down the road or so in Wilson. And that is something that we certainly need to continue to make that important. Those rides are $1. I need to start using those things. I'll see when I get somewhere. Uh, That's fine. So I am a Wilson 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 I experienced the Wilson ride. My students, when I taught in Wilson at Wilson Early College, um, they would, and I think I just said something, students. They got our population here in Rocky Mountain. Everyone's parents came pick them up uh, right after school, what have you. The Wilson ride has literally uh, used something that makes it safe for kids to get home. The parent can book the ride or the kid can book the ride, but at least you know they're somewhere safe and they're going to get dropped off. Now, I'm not an advocate for for all kids. So Wilson Ride also has some parameters. So if, you know, anybody can't just get in. There's some age restrictions or what have you. But my students were high school students. So most of the time, they benefited from it heavily. So I'm definitely for it. And it was about 25. All right. How can we advocate for and redirect investments in black and brown neighborhoods? Excuse me. How can how can we advocate for and redirect investments in black and brown neighborhoods? I think the current council has done that and has been going on over the last 20 years uh, plus since we've had a majority of African American council. And so I believe that just continuing the work that has been done and also looking at uh, more innovative and creative ways to continue to do so. Um, if you were asking how as the people can advocate for it, I believe coming to council meetings is uh, Great start. Uh, calling your council member, having those conversations about how you want to see investment in the community. But uh, coming to council meetings is one. Uh, calling your council members, and then also uh, just having people to rally together and say, "Listen, this is our city. This is our voice, and this city moves based on the voice of the people that are around." I would. I would like to see. Um, I, I have a copy of. 200 black owned businesses, um, some I was aware of, some I wasn't. Uh, but I would like to see or implement the city to give us opportunity to be able to have uh, workshops to teach um, black businesses what they need to know. How can I get funding? Maybe something they may have missed. But I think if we educate them as to how we can help invest in them even more, I think that's what we need to do. Just a quick quote. We have an MWBE program currently with the city of Rocky Mountain that hosts those workshops that educates our minority-owned and women-owned businesses um, all throughout the city of how to be able to uh, properly have your business for contracts and for procurement with the city of Rocky Mountain. So those things are already in place. Thank you. I, I do think the city of Rocky Mountain has done a phenomenal job with uh, helping black and brown people uh, with investments in the community, existing communities. Um, I think we can go a step further by obviously um, providing education on traditional and non-traditional funding. Um, those are some of the routes that I took to become um, a business owner. Um, every bank isn't going to lend to you, um, and we know why. Sometimes it is just simply the color of your skin. Um, sometimes there's, it's because of your credit challenges. Um, so we have to educate one another and let them know um, that there are other opportunities out there for you. There's some some uh, black market funding that, that will enable you to grow your business. So just in educating um, our, our black and brown communities, minority communities, um, let's do it, stand up, let's get it done. Again, um, the house incentive uh, grants, uh, small business <coughs> development, uh, the council initiative, downtown business grant, uh, MWBE, making sure that uh, when we award these contracts, that they hire uh, minorities and make sure that they are on their payroll. It's one thing is to, uh, for people to get the contract, but not uh, having minority women that they uh, subcontract with. Uh, we need to do a disparity study so we can get more money into our uh, black and brown businesses. But without that study, uh, how we know where we're going to fund them, how to fund them equitably. Uh, we just uh, received a grant for $75,000. It talks about how the municipal strategies to narrow the racial uh, wealth gap. And we just had that uh, 
symposium that the event center, and I think we have at least two or three more um, uh, symposiums to educate the people on that racial wealth gap. That's how the city can close that gap, help close that gap. <coughs> How would you support individuals in gaining access to funding for community restoration projects? So during my tenure as council member, um, I've held personal workshops at many of our local small um, businesses, minority and unknown businesses that allow people to have access to capital and to have access to the information for capital. So uh, it's about really making sure that you meet people where they are. We have. Uh, community association groups in all of our neighborhoods. And I believe it's about making sure that we bring the information to our people, to our community. For the final question in the quality of life section, how would you ensure there is equitable economic growth in both counties of Rocky Mountain? Um, how can I ensure economic uh, growth in both counties? This is start with Ward 1 in Edgecombe County, where I was raised most of my life. Um, obviously, we have some disparities in our community. Um, we, we need to focus on, you know, obviously improving our housing stock, but also reducing um, some of our crime, um, but then also recruiting businesses. Corporate businesses is what keeps a community healthy. Sometimes um, small businesses as well. Um, as you all know, um, small businesses is the backbone of our is, is the backbone of America. And so we need to um, you know obviously get those grown um, so that we can improve you know the quality of life in our community. When you say um, to have equitable equitable growth in both counties, it's very obvious that one um, county is already one side of the city is already um, in the zone of having equitable so our concentration should be on bringing the other side of the city. I hate to say this side and that side, but at the end of it all, we are Rocky Mountain. So you can't look at the growth on one side and not be concerned about equitable development on the other side. So focus on putting more funding on the area that is already behind in the growth. I think one thing we can do is uh, focus on some of our nonprofits and organizations that are doing the work, um, like OIC. We only have, OIC is the only organization on Edgecombe County Star that focuses on workforce development and trying to train people. When we talk about equity and that being, uh, having uh, equitable growth, we have to be able to train people uh, for different jobs that are coming. We have to be able to prepare them for what's coming uh, because that's how we make the equitable change. 
uh, making sure that people still have uh, the equal opportunity to uh, make the same amount of money as a Nash County resident, uh, live in the same type of neighborhood as a Nash County resident. But then again, uh, some of it can look like if we enforce our code for some of our properties uh, to just make them look better than what they do, and people will try to feel better a lot about what they say. Also, not about a dollar versus dollar. We actually got to look at these conditions, right? So we got to look at each ward one through seven and identify where the conditions are that need the most attention. And when we address those conditions and address those issues, uh, sometimes you got to spend more money somewhere else. So you, oftentimes we, we find ourselves with this person got ten dollars, we get next person ten dollars, but that's not going to fix the problem that's at hand. So it really got to be condition oriented, issue oriented, so we can fix. Uh, true equitable uh, situations in our community and really have the equality we're looking for. I think you think in terms of, uh, I just got one statement on that, it's simply quality of life. I think sometimes we just need the whole Nash County account. just had a pay study done that showed us some of those inequities that we see and uh, what we have to do is uh, look at each department uh, each at a time and see how it is that we can inc increase each department within our budget uh, to make those necessary changes. Uh, I don't believe you can do it all at one time. Again, we're looking at uh, all of what we heard tonight about where we need investment and where we need money. Uh, again, we've got to find the money to be able to do what it is we need to do. But uh, I believe we can uh, pay all of our workers a uh, fair share of pay, which uh, I, don't, I don't think we have uh, necessarily inequalities in our uh, pay per se. If that's the case, then uh, that would have been a common conversation that would have been properly addressed by now, saying that we've had a majority of council for uh, over 20 years. So thank you. I would say uh, my. Uh, 
my incumbent voted against the sanitation orders. And he didn't give, you know, the post department, you said 37%, fire department 20%. We don't look at the sanitation workers and their job is just as valuable. And as anything else that we just mentioned, it's sad. I went to the, the council meeting when they stood up, and we're still fighting for them. That they deserve the raise that they get. And they said to him, you failed us on your promise. I won't. You have 30 seconds. Yeah, uh, they didn't say that I failed them on the promise. Uh, I said we need 90 days in order to address the issue. And I believe we're coming up on those 90 days and we'll be addressing in our committee to hold and search up. Thank you. Uh, but again, uh, for individuals that are already coming in line, that's going to be tough to have that as a representative. Thank you. So, uh, yes. The City Council has voted to prioritize policing in the 2023 fiscal year budget. The police department got a 37% increase and the fire department's increase was above 20%. How will you address inequities in workers' pay in sanitation, parks and recreation, and public works departments? So how I would address that is hold our city manager feet to the fire. Um, we got a pay study done that sat on the desk at City Hall on the fifth floor for years. Okay, and so we had a city council who allowed her to not even open the book. And so we have to hold the people that we hire at a standard so that the citizens and our employees can see what's going on. And so we have a pay study that was done by our former city manager, Rochelle Smalltoni, um, that this council shot down and never opened it back up, just like we had a plan for downtown that was shot down, that set on the desk and collected dust. Um, we, we don't know how to go back to things and say, let's pick some things out that we like take some things away that we don't like, and let's get this thing moving forward. So if that pay study has been done, it was done again, and hopefully that it will address those inequalities in that pay study. Well, I have a rebuttal, but then I want to answer the question too. I just want to say that it's not true about uh, Rochelle Small Tony. Uh, we had the study, but the study did not address all our employees. Therefore, we did not, the city council approved it uh, because uh, all the employees would have gotten a raise and we've been in the same mess that we're in now. Uh, the ratio plan, uh, we bought it. Uh, we, have, we had the plan, but we didn't approve it because it didn't address gentrification. And you all out here better really take a good look at us and look at these people on this dais and the ones that's gonna be at the city council that's welcoming these developers come here that's going to push you out of your community. Mm. That's what we need to get a hold of. We need to educate our community. Don't sell your property for 15 cents and then they turn around and sell it for $200,000. That's gentrification. Now I want to answer the question. The council did not vote on the 36% increase. The council notified uh, the late, uh, the ninth hour before it was uh, uh, before the city manager uh, announced that uh, it was not uh, it, it was not brought before the board council, but we support our police department and not uh, we we dealing now about the, the pay increase for sound tax, but we're also now dealing with retaliation because Time. some of your brothers just got retaliated against, and that's a serious Time. problem that this council Time. must address. I like many Rocky Mountain natives and residents, when they saw on the news that the police had got a raise and, you know, said start to pay $60,000, I was shocked. Was I happy? Yeah, I was happy too. I was like, well, we need some more people to here, pay them all. But at the same time, when I did find out that they did the thing, but they didn't do it all the way, that they didn't do it for all people, that's what really struck me. I feel like if you're going to be our city manager, you're going to step out there and put, put your foot out there, put a budget out there, and pay folk, pay all the folk. 
Because if not, you're not going to have no fruit. And my kids love the sanitation worker. They wave at him every morning, and they love garbage trucks. So we got to keep my boy. I like him. He helps my mornings out. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next question is, would you support a demonstration by the sanitation workers if their demands are not met? That's a loaded question now. First of all, why should they have to strike? They should be treated with respect. No matter uh, the fact that they have worked through the COVID, through the heat, consistently. Did the police officers have to strike? Did the firefighters have to strike? So why should the sanitation have to strike in order to get a pay raise? They should be treated with respect and dignity. And yes, I would support the sanitation workers, but hopefully we will not have to go to those extreme measures. The current city council, and by the way, we only needed four votes. We need to find out who voted against the sanitation workers getting their races. So yes, I will support them, but hopefully we will not have to go to those extremes. I was one of the people that went to Raleigh for our Red for Ed rally with all the teachers. So I won't just support them. I'll be walk off with them when they walk out. I would definitely stand and support them. Did, but I also will put a policy in place to protect the workers' rights. Although we can read this, but it says, I am a man. And then when Dr. King went to Memphis, he was shot down like a dog for organizing and walking with the sanitation workers. And I stand with any worker's right to organize when they're being discriminated against. And again, we're dealing with the pay increase of the sanitation work, but now we're dealing with a retaliation of a sanitation employee. And what we're gonna do as a council? Wow. What y'all gonna do for ones that's running that's not on the council? I wanna see all of us stand up, whether you win or not, or whether you uh, uh, in support the person who they have retaliated against starting today. So you're going to shut it down, shut it down. So that's what I'm going to do. I stand with the uh, sanitation workers. Um, it's a part of democracy. If they want to walk out, that's, that's their duty. Um, I stand with them. Not only will I stand with them, but I walk out with them, just like Joshua said. Um, the point is, is that, you know, we keep talking about this pay study, but no one has told us what the sanitation workers starting pay is. I asked one of those sanitation workers what the starting pay was, and he told me $18 an hour. $18 an hour. Raleigh started paying for a sanitation worker, it's $20 an hour. So are we being fair? I don't know. That's not my job. That's for the CEO of this city to figure that out. Um, Raleigh has over a million residents. Rocky Mountain has 50,000 residents. I live residents of Rocky Mountain figure that out. I, I uh, talking about the sanitation workers and demonstrating, of course, I've uh, participated in a number of demonstrations. What I do believe is that the role of the mayor is not to single out whether it's four votes or one vote, <laughs> but really work to unify that we have seven votes, but we do all business within our community. That is important. We must be united as a community. It is important also that citizens do understand, as Mr. Davis just said, what the sanitation workers are getting paid. Because we'll say that they're not paid fairly, they didn't get a raise of this, that, and that, but what are they getting paid? What, what do we compare that to? and see if we're being fair. It's one thing to get excited about it and want a chance for everybody to get more money. I get it, everybody needs more money. But it must be fair to everybody in the city. And, and also, when there are vacancies, we got new things to address vacancies by police department as well. Thank you. I will support the uh, administration if the sanitation workers desire to do that. Uh, again, I just find it hard to believe, we're talking about equity and equality, I find it hard to believe that this city as a majority African American council has a sanitation department that is treated inequitably and not paying them uh, what is equitable across the state. And again, I said we got 90 days. My vote no was to say we have 90 days to figure out 
if we are indeed paying them equity, and what can we do as a city to pay them more within our limits? Thank you. Okay. Who do they compare the police mayor, department with? You should be concerned about your employees. You should be concerned about fair treatment. So the mayor's role is to promote the betterment of the city as well as the workers. So again, the mayor does have an important role to respect the employees under their leadership. Uh, unity, it's hard to have unity without justice. Mm. It's hard to be unified when your belly is growling. Mm. And you can't buy your food, take your medication, your utility bill. And for the record, it doesn't take 90 days. It didn't take our city manager 90 days to decide to give the police department 36%. Right right now. He didn't give us 90 days to let the council think, to think about it. He called us the night before, and then he made the move the next day. So I'm for unity, but I'm for justice. No justice, no peace. Time. No justice, no peace. Go ahead, Councilman Walker. Councilman, I, if it doesn't take 90 days to figure it out, surely it shouldn't take 20 years. <laughs> down to 7,300 days. 7,300 days, we have employees that are quote unquote underpaid. We have gyms still in the city of right now with no air conditioning and a majority black community. There's a list that goes on and on and on. But 7,300 days, it should not take that. Okay, so we are gonna, so we're gonna get a feel from the audience. We do have your questions. We want to know, would you like for us to pull three questions, or are you satisfied with the questions that have been asked? Okay, all right. Well, great. That means we did our job. All right, y'all get yourselves a round of applause. All right, so. We just want to take the time uh, right now to thank the candidates for coming tonight um, and for their participation. Um, well done. To the NAACP Executive Committee and Political Action Committee, thank you for engineering the forum and bringing this to life. Um, I want to personally thank this president of NAACP, personally thank Sydney Meeks. Y'all give her a round of applause. Brian Hendricks and Lisa Lynch. Their, their coordination for today's what you see in front of you today um, and most importantly I want to thank you all for tuning in and showing up tonight to everybody that's joined us both virtual and in person we please consider joining the NAACP we have representatives available for you if you'd like to join um, and you can if you're online you can go to NAACP.org and click join now the link is on the live stream it's also in our bio on our social media. Select chapter 5441-B and pay your $35. You can support us by participating with us and donating to our chapter. And in closing, please take a moment to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Rocky Mountain NAACP. This concludes the 2023 Rocky Mountain Municipal Candidates Forum. Good night.
definitely clear that some of the new council members that have come on have a personal agenda. It's not about it's what uh, can be done for the city. It's about different, uh, it's different, uh, each of different council members with their own agenda. It's clearly there's a divide. Uh, what, um, what they base the uh, police um, pay on. It didn't take 90 days for that. Also, what people need to understand is that um, it was four council members that had the numbers that um, brought in the new city manager. So therefore, if you watch carefully, you'll see who is the uh, city manager uh, puppets. Uh, do your own homework. Um, you know, it, it, it's amazing to me um, what's going on in the city. Look at um, the those black folk who uh, want to represent you have switched from Democrat to unaffiliated. What's the purpose of that? Yeah, the city council is a nonpartisan uh, seat. However, it makes a difference who, uh, what party you represent. Um, how many of the black council, white council have um, have they have uh, changed their party their party affiliation um, to um, unaffiliated? They know the reason behind being committed to a party or uh, uh, um, uh, 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 a part of a political party. Look at Raleigh. The reason why I come the reason why people are able to do what they do. In the um, in the legislatures because they have the majority Republican folk understand the process, and I also want to go back to um, the, the the race um, the, the the race four years ago between T.J. Walker and Elaine Williams. A lot of folk in the committee in in, in the um, during that time felt like that race was against um, not about. TJ and, and uh, Elaine, it was about um, um, the two pastors, Reverend Thomas Walker and James Gates. When I came to uh, become an activist back in the 80s, one of the things I said when I went to the Democratic Party, the NAACP, and all those uh, different organizations, we need a coming to Jesus meeting in the black community. We need to get in the room and see who's with who. Which I already know, I don't need it, but some folk need it. And get in the room and see who's with who. And once they leave the room, see who return. I have been in meetings and folk have got up and walked out simply because I said, um, how can I support an unaffiliated person coming to a Democratic Party meeting? I can't. Um, one thing is, I feel like they holding that status that they will go to both means and share the strategies on the Democratic side. So, hey, I, 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 folks, you better do your own homework. Also, a lot of people are saying that they don't know what people are, are campaigns are. Well, if you don't know, won't you go out and ask somebody? Some people know. And it's up to you whether you trust in that person you confide in. I know for myself, I've been out here since the 80s 
travel all over the state and um, no folk on the, the local, state, and national level. Now, if it's somebody that I don't know the thing about, I make a phone call. And um, I ask my resources, what, um, what do they know about the folk? And I trust in my resources until they mislead me. So again, folk, do your homework. If you don't know who they are, what their issues are, then you need to ask somebody. I'm available 24 hours a day. If I don't pick up, leave a voice message. I tell folk all the time, I know who the players are. I know what they're all about. <laughs> so I don't have that problem. My phone number is 252-314-5484. You can reach me. Um, well, my information is right here on, the, um, on, on my Facebook page. So reach out. Hey, I'm about justice no matter who it's for or against. Yeah, I remember you. I am unbought. I am unbought. I ain't got time for a whole lot of foolishness. And what people need to understand, I tell people all the time, when you're running for something in, uh, that, that, that affects Edgecombe County side where I live, just because I don't live in Rocky Mount, but I am a member of the Edgecombe County Democratic Party on the local and state level. So if you want to represent me, you better contact me because when you don't, then you're fair game. So none of you have contacted me except Teresa, Andre, and, you know, it is what it is. So, hey, I am the political agitator. I do what I do, and I try to make sure I get the facts out. If I was to error, I will come back and I will uh, correct it, but I ain't never been right wrong but one time, and I found I was really right. Y'all have a good night.